So um, we'll start with just a little bit like we do of uh, tended to do of, um, just a few minutes of uh, med contemplative meditation. And we, I'll get back to this what we were doing before, which is, um, you know, because so we, then we'll um, do refuge in Bodhicitta. But we'll, so we can think about, I'm going to use uh, just some lines from the last class um, for our contemplation, right? So, so last class we studied this the verse that said um the Dharmakaya of the Tathagatas uh, in the totally pure state is immutable because of being endowed with the qualities of inexhaustibility. It is a refuge for migrators because it is continuous and without end. So we can just think like that we're, you know, when we think of taking refuge, right? Sometimes we just say the words like I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and so on. But here we can just contemplate for a few minutes that we're, you know, the actual refuge, and as this text teaches, is the Buddha's Dharmakaya. So the Buddha's, say, wisdom mind. And as it says, that's a true refuge for beings. And, um, and also says, because the Dharma is endowed with limitless qualities, it has the meaning of being immutably permanent because it's equal to the limits of samsara. It has the meaning of being a constant refuge. So the, um, and so when we take refuge in the Dharmakaya, right? There are two ways, as this text teaches, there are two ways to do that. One is, one way of doing it is that we can think we're taking refuge in the Dharmakaya achieved by someone else. Right? So in other words, some other Buddhas. We've got like Shakyamuni Buddhas. But this text teaches the, you know, the, the final meaning of refuge right? is taking refuge in your own future Dharmakaya. In order to become a refuge until the you know an eternal permanent right, constant refuge, mm. and this text teaches right that it's the, the um, ultimate nature of your mind now is totally undifferentiable from the nature of the Dharmakaya. They're equally empty, intrinsic nature. That's what this section's been teaching about. So because my mind right now has this nature, the Buddha nature, Its ultimate nature is undifferential from the mind of Shakyamuni Buddha, and undifferential from my the ultimate nature of my future Dharma Kaya. And so I take refuge. In the result of refuge, I take refuge in my own future attainment of that dharmakaya for the welfare of all sentient beings. Hmm. It's a refuge in the sense that when I achieve that, right, I'll have achieved, first of all, all my own purposes. Right? As the text teaches, right, my, my experience will be uh, Irreversible, blissful, you know, total bliss, total peace, total freedom from suffering. And also, I'll be of the omniscient mind, the effortless capacity of a Buddha to work for the welfare of all others. So that's my refuge. 
And that's what I'm like, that's what I'm intending towards, heading towards. And just take a moment to notice sometimes it can feel, right, like uh, such Buddhahood is far off. But then particularly just for a moment, because this text is teaching it, just contemplate for a moment how, right, as I said, the ultimate nature of my mind right this moment is Buddha nature, is here now in this moment. It's the nature, right? It's the nature of my mind in this moment. And it's totally undifferentiable. That ultimate nature from the ultimate nature of Dharmakaya. wishing to achieve the welfare of others and also myself. I aspire to that state of Dharmakaya. And then with that, just kind of, you know, kind of keeping that in mind, we'll slowly go through that one verse, right? So I go for refuge. until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the merits of giving or generosity and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then, uh, in a moment, we'll start the text, but actually, I wanted to check. I think um, John, uh, at the end of last class, I said, oh, at the beginning, we can start with, uh, you had a comment or a question. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump. So do you want to do you want to ask or make your comment or question before I jump into the text? Uh, you know, my suggestion would be to go ahead with, with your presentation. Okay. And uh, if it's in context later, which I, I'm guessing it will be, then, then I can jump in. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, but I mean that that was just really an engaging discussion at the end of last week's class. So, and uh, I wish I could have been there present. I'm not sure who the other people were who, who were speaking, but I uh, I grapple with those same ideas, and so I, I I did have some thoughts on that. Oh, great. Okay. Well, yeah. I hope you'll jump in. Let me get to whichever part is feels relevant. So. Okay. We'll jump in. Um. <clears throat> And uh, we've been covering, like, so we're we're on the, in general, we're on the um, the third Vajra topic, right? The Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, call it a uh, very better, more accurate, uh, well, it is more accurate term. And we've been covering the 10, uh, uh, ten, ten um, I forget what term they use, but essentially 10 qualities or 10 presentations about that. And we're on the 10th, the last of those presentations. Uh, that sort of are getting at things about Buddha nature. So this is the end of this section. I mean, still, we're going to keep this. It's not the end of the section on Buddha nature, to be clear. That continues on for quite a while. But it's the end of the section on the 10 presentations. Next come the nine similes, which are quite beautiful. And um, either get, we'll start them today or next time. But, um, but the 10th of these 10 uh, presentations is called the indivisibility of qualities. And so, um, so it says, I'll, I'll first read the text, establishing an indivisible, indivisibility of the qualities of freedom at the time of total purity. So now it's getting at, at the time of total purity means Buddhahood, right? Uh, so before we were talking about how, you know, we were getting at this point that, um, let's say it, you know, the, that the ultimate nature of the impure state then the pure and impure, which are going through those different levels or bhumis that bodhisattvas go through, and at the time of the result, the tagata, as I was just saying, are the ultimate nature of mind stays 
emptiness. So it's undifferentiable in that sense. So now we're up to um, at the total at the end, right? At the state of Buddhahood, right? At that at the um, total state of total purity. That's Buddhahood, right? That's the end state that you're aiming for. So it says. Uh, First here, it uses uh, four synonyms here. It says the perfect Buddha is the Dharmakaya. Right? So the truth body, that's usually translated. Right? And this is now he's going to, he's, he's uh, Maitreya. Maitreya here is, is having four synonyms. The Dharmakaya, the Tathagata, the Arya's ultimate truth, and non-abiding Nirvana. And so he uses these four terms. And there are four terms that are describing that state. Right? Um, these four are just as indivisible as the sun and its rays. Because of the indivisibility of the qualities, there is no non-abiding nirvana apart from Buddhahood. Um, so a few points is probably worth making, right? Um, The sun and its rays metaphor. I'll just I'll say more about in a minute because that comes. Uh, also, it makes it clear in the next couple of um, verses. So I won't get into that quite yet. But um, so a few points I'll make. One is uh, so dharmakaya. I'll go through the terms first of all. Dharmakaya usually translated truth body, right? Um, Tathagata means you can translate that like what? Uh, gate is like gone, like gate, gate, paragate. Uh, one thus gone or one well gone you know, one gone thus I guess one thus gone or one gone thus you could say it that way um, and it, uh, anyway then the Arya's ultimate truth right the noble ones the ultimate truth for the noble ones and then non-abiding nirvana um, and what is non-abiding nirvana right that um, just to clarify that right nirvana is like a um, state of peace or the state beyond the suffering right uh but um sometimes we say that uh they'll say that um those who have achieved individual liberation like the arhats or the prajega buddhas abide in nirvana right meaning that they abide in a state of individual peace and part of what they're getting at here is that there's that's well, one point is that's still dualistic isn't it like uh there is a there's a, a kind of nirvana that's separate and apart from uh the suffering of sentient beings, and um, at one point is the Buddha's vow was that they wouldn't they wouldn't want if there were if, if nirvana if the final nirvana was such a state then a Buddha wouldn't want that right a Buddha wants to be present to benefit others right so a, they say a Buddha doesn't abide in samsara and, do, and not abiding I mean, Buddhas don't abide in samsara but they also don't abide in nirvana in the sense they've achieved that kind of if if nirvana in the sense that nirvana is a state beyond suffering of course they've achieved that. But they don't abide in, in a nirvana that's dualistically separate from the welfare of sentient beings. Um, so it's a kind. Of, that's the kind. Of, you know. So it's a, it's a. That's the state of a Buddha. Um, so uh, so one point is that those four terms are synonyms here. Uh, another point where it says there is no non-abiding nirvana apart from Buddhahood. Uh, in the commentary, it says that, that um, implies that the. This text, the Uttara Tantra, um, follows you know, the Jamaka position. Uh, of, and you know, I'm, I'm going to be a little philosophical. I'm going to say some philosophical stuff and get into some philosophical issues today. So one is um, that that uh, that line sort of Im implicitly brings up, or bring, I guess brings up um, the one vehicle approach, which means. Uh, the view, which is a Majamaka view, which this text follows Majamaka school, that there's one final vehicle, that all beings uh, are destined to, uh, at some point in the future, if they haven't already, achieve uh, this non-abiding nirvana of a Buddha. Uh, because there are some Buddhist tenet systems that assert three final vehicles, that well, you can that you sort of can... Some they, they would assert that uh, somebody who wants to become an arhat can sort of follow the path of an arhat and practice the three higher trainings, you know, uh, training in higher training in ethics, the higher training in meditative concentration, and the higher training in wisdom, and can achieve their own individual nirvana, and that's their sort of final goal. 
or Pracheka Buddha, right? They can practice their path and achieve their final goal of Pracheka Buddhahood. And then Bodhisattvas achieve their final view. So those, those, that tenet system asserts three final vehicles, that there are sort of three goals that you can achieve. The Majamaka position, because of because of the teaching on Buddha nature disciplines, and because all beings' minds are empty, and because it's possible for all beings to achieve Buddhahood, say, well, then all beings have to, you know, have to eventually achieve Buddhahood. So this idea that uh that beings will eventually achieve non-abiding nirvana and that um any other thing is not a final endpoint to their path. Uh, is a, is a implied in that verse, according to the commentary. Um, and then, uh, I'll just go on, and then I'll sort of say more. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, t I'll mention the two next next two verses because they reflect on that verse, and then we'll cover say more about it. So, in brief, the non-afflicted sphere is distinguished by four meanings, and is to be known by way of these four synonyms, the Dharmakaya and so forth, right? So that's what I just said, those four. And it says, indivisible from the qualities of a Buddha, um, attainment of the lineage as it is, reality that is non-deceptive and not false, and by nature at peace since beginningless time. Um, so this is, those four lines are describing those four terms, right? And remember, on the one hand, they're synonyms, so they mean the same, they're all referring to the same thing, right? But they are different terms. And those different terms are getting at different aspects or different ways of thinking about that final state. So uh, indivisible from the qualities of a Buddha refers to Dharmakaya, right? That term Dharmakaya. Um, and one point there is that, right, so the... Um, and so one point I guess you could say is that that emptiness of the Buddha's mind um, is undifferentiable from the Buddha's compassion, right? Or it's not separate. That's what it says here, indivisible, right? Indivisible or not separate from the Buddha's compassion. It's not separate from the Buddha's teaching voice. It's not separate from the Buddha's body making gestures and so on. Then attainment of the lineage as it is, right? Lineage meaning... Um, uh, the lineage of the Buddha, right? The lineage of Buddha nature. Um, so that that's a reference to Tathagata, right? So um, what they've gone to is reality as it is, right? Or they've gone to where, so, you know, the Buddha didn't go to a place, right? The Buddha went to reality, to a state that's uh, directly perceiving the nature of reality continuously with no superimpositions and no, um, what's the word? I don't know. No, super, no superimposing things that aren't there, but also no denying things that are there. Um, then reality that is non-deceptive and not false. That's a reference to the Arya's ultimate truth, right? Uh, so it's not deceptive and it's not false. There's no, And not deceptive because everything else we perceive, right? Everything ordinary people perceive has an aspect of uh, being deceptive. You know, even if even if it's, even when we have valid cognitions, like, you know, if I see Jan sitting there, I, I do see Jan sitting there, but there's a deceptive quality that I, I, I perceive that dualistically. I perceive that as though Jan exists intrinsically uh, from her own side. So there's a, an aspect of uh, deception there. The Buddhas don't see things in that way. They see things uh, in a way that's not false and not deceptive. And then by nature, peace since beginningless time. So that's a reference to the emptiness of the mind itself, right? So peace since beginningless time means uh, pacify, you know, that the mind was empty since beginning of this time. It, it's not something added to the mind. And there's nothing that was taken away from the mind in that sense. The mind already was empty of intrinsic existence. Um, in terms of the, uh, I, mean, I wrote this quote down, so I'll share it. Uh, so I mentioned Gyal Sub Jay interprets uh, the above it, as the one, ve as asserting the one vehicle theory. And um, Asanga does as well, because uh, so, uh, Asanga says, oh, I wrote down a quote, yes. that the nirvana of hearers and solitary realizer, Prachika Buddhas, is, he, he gives this metaphor from a sutra. He says, it's just as an illusory city in a forest um, for exhausted travelers after a long journey. Uh, 
and so what he's getting at there is like um you know that's actually you can i think you can imagine this isn't it like so some 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 people right uh bodhisattvas aren't like this that's why i see some people bodhisattvas don't have this quality but some people are weary from the suffering of samsara or actually bodhisattvas are also weary of that <laughs> but uh but bodhisattvas have a kind of bravery of saying i don't care if i'm weary i'll work for the welfare of others uh where some people are tired you know they see the nature of suffering they see their own and other suffering and, and they feel it's unbearable they feel as well, Asanga says, uh, worn out. And so for them, the, Asanga sort of giving this metaphor, he's saying for them, the Buddha teaches the vehicle of Shravakas, the, you know, so the vehicle of the Arhats, the vehicle of the Prachika Buddhas. And he says, um, and in the sense that he teaches that uh, something they can, they, or a place where they can rest, right? Uh, in individual liberation. Uh and Asanga saying they can rest there. The Buddha's not lying. There is the beings can rest there. It gives them a kind of it gives them peace, uh, freedom from suffering. But he says it's like an illusory uh city. You know? So they're like, you imagine they're they've been wandering in the forest, they're exhausted, they're hungry, they're tired, they're whatever. And so the Buddha creates this illusory city for them to rest in, right? And says, Okay, you know, it's pretty here, and you can have a, have something to eat and have a drink and uh, sleep for the night and so on. Um, but it's illusory in the sense that it's still dualistic, right? It's, it's not getting at the ultimate final state. And so um, and so Asanga sort of explains that, that uh, the Buddha gives them that place to rest because they've been weary in the suffering of samsara and it's something that they can achieve. Uh, and then later the Buddha will come back and sort of say, okay, now is time. The Buddha awakens them from, they sort of abide in this subtle body in a pure land, abide, you know, in a kind of inert, inner state of cessation from, of suffering uh and then eventually the buddha will come to them and say now is time you know you're you're, you're ready to you've rested long enough it's time to work for the welfare of others uh, and then they begin they have to start from the beginning of the bodhisattva path at that point so it takes much longer by the way it's a it's a much longer way to achieve buddhahood <laughs> to do it that way uh bodhisattvas achieve buddhahood much more quickly but um but it's it's a resting place for beings who, uh, for whom that's their disposition, or that's their need, or that's their. Um, so uh, that's the way Asanga expresses that in, in uh, his commentary to this text. So he's also saying it's a one vehicle uh, approach that this text teaches. Um, continuing on, it, um, it says uh, thoroughly complete enlightenment in all aspects abandonment of the defilements with their imprints, Buddhahood and non-abiding nirvana are, to are ultimately non-dual, right? So that, and there's part of, you know, so it's not, you know, sometimes we'll say the Buddha achieved non-abiding nirvana. What this is saying is actually the Buddha is non-abiding nirvana because uh, it's not some, you know, it's not a place and it's not a thing. It's, it's a way of being, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's a way of existing. Um, so it's thoroughly complete. It, it is thoroughly complete enlightenment in all aspects. It has abandoned, and it, this is an important point here. It says abandonment of all the defilements. So the defilements, right, are the mental afflictions. So the Buddha has achieved the state, right, where they've abandoned all, including the most subtle forms of attachment, of aversion, of anger, of pride, and so on, and of their imprints, right? It's their subtle imprints that um, are obstacles to omniscience. So the Buddha uh, abandons those as well, right? So the Buddha will, uh, abandons even the subtlest imprints or you know, leftover stains from the mental afflictions. Um, and so those are unique features of a Buddha. And so therefore Buddhahood and non-abiding nirvana are ultimately non-dual, right? So the, the Buddha has achieved that because the Buddha is in a, such a state, they're in non-abiding nirvana. So, and part of the point there is, so what is non-abiding nirvana, right? It's a state in which you've abandoned all the mental afflictions and all their imprints. It's not something else, right? And by having abandoned those, you're in this state that's effortless and that's just an expression of skill, compassion, love, and so on, uh, free from all suffering. So, you know, it's getting a point here, which is nirvana, this non-abiding nirvana is not something other than that. That's what non-divine nirvana is, is such a state. 
Then it says, uh, liberation is inseparable in its character from all aspects, the innumerable and inconceivable and the quality of being without defilement. Whatever is liberation is also the Tathagata. Um, so what that's getting at here is that the omniscience of a Buddha and the Buddha's infinite positive qualities um, are inseparable from the ultimate truth of the Buddha's mind, which is the final cessation of all obstacles. So the Buddha has achieved this final cessation of all obstacles uh, that's undifferentiable from the ultimate truth or the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. And that emptiness of the Buddha's mind is undifferentiable from the Buddha's infinite positive qualities, right? And that's why actually, you know, in the Tibetan, right, there's the term uh, like Zhang Chup, for example, means enlightenment. That's the Tibetan word for enlightenment. So, and Zhang means to purify and Chup means to achieve, right? So even the word in Tibetan uh, for, for we don't have a word quite like that. I don't think that we can, enlightenment doesn't have the same connotation in that way. Um, but so, you know, the term Zhang Chup, right? So Zhang means what this is getting at, has fully purified all the mental afflictions and all their subtle imprints. Chup, right, Chup, uh, means to have, like every good quality you have, and I have, that we have. So like we have some love, the Buddha has taken that to the infinite, right? We have some compassion, the Buddha has taken that to the infinite. We have some understanding, the Buddha has taken that to the infinite. Uh, so they've achieved these positive qualities as well. Those positive qualities of the, of the Buddha that the Buddha has achieved are not separate from the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. Does that make sense? So they're, they're, those go together, they're indivisible, is what this is saying. Um, in the... Um, Beautiful teaching in the Pramana of Arctica, um, you know, the text on valid cognition and epistemology. It makes this point. It says, you know, makes certain points. It says, you know, um, in uh, physical traits, we can increase, we can get stronger, for example, we can jump higher, but there's a limit. You know, you can only jump so high and you can only get so strong. You know? um, and then it says, the mind is not like that. By uh, Dharma Kirti makes that point. He says the mind is not like that. The mind doesn't have such a limitation. So, like, you know, you you can get strong, but you can't get your your arms can't get infinitely strong, obviously. Whereas he says, but the the nature of mind is such, and he's getting it because the mind is empty of intrinsic existence, and because the mind's nature is clarity. Also, you know, if you have some love, you can make love infinite. That's the nature of that because the mind is such. That it can be that good qualities can be increased limitlessly, and he 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 says you know compassion or skill or understanding, and then he says um, that's why Buddha is possible. So he's actually explaining some of this text is getting at here uh, that such a state is possible, uh, and that purifying all the negative qualities of mind removes the obstacles to increasing those positive qualities. Right. And um, and the nature of mind is still empty, intrinsic nature, and and it's because of its emptiness, as we've been saying all along, that 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 positive development is also possible. So a quick question, probably a deeper question, but so when when the statement is not in this text, but that um, all karma, even the smallest action, increases, is it based on the same principle of when we? We purify, we we rid our, ourselves of those negative actions and purify at the same principle. Now all these good qualities can increase more and more. I mean, if you do one small act of kindness, that also increases. I know it's dualistic. I I, I know. That's good. Cool. I guess I'll say on one end, it's true. At one point I'll make that it's true. It's true that um both negative karma and positive karma, one of the qualities of karma is it increases. So that's true if you do a negative action. It's also true if you do a positive action. Um, but really, that's that's a quality of karma. You know, so that is true of positive karmic actions and negative karmic actions. I think the point about the Buddha being able to sort of create, uh, or anybody actually, you know, uh, that we can make our, our positive qualities infinite uh, that's not a quality of karma specifically. That's a quality of the mind. So that okay. it's different. So the, the one that, that karma increases is a quality of karma that's true of both positive and negative. But this capacity of the mind 
because it's nature is clarity and emptiness that whatever qualities we cultivate can be cultivated infinitely that's I, I don't think that's a quality of karma that's a quality of mind itself okay so they're actually two different yeah yep yeah, that's right laws. yeah two different laws that's right okay. yeah like that's a good way i sometimes think of that two different natural laws okay yeah. thank you and then starts uh then uh maitreya uh It does something interesting. He take this comes from a sutra. Maitreya kind of takes a, a teaching from a sutra and um, applies it here. So I'll, I'll read what he says, and then I'm going to sort of comment on it. And it's a, a number of verses, but he says he says, for example, so he's going to use a example or story. He says, painters who are specialized in painting individual parts of the body paint whatever part is known to them and do not work in any other part than that. So he's creating a kind of story here. He's saying. I'm going to rephrase it for a second. He says, imagine a kingdom, right? And in this kingdom, there are these um, six painters. And one is an ex is, a, is a special expert at painting faces. Another paints hands. You know, another paints torsos. But they only specialize in parts of the body. That's the nature of these painters, you know, these artists. They're not just like art. art paint, painter here means like artist painter, not like a wall. You know, not somebody's uh, painting a house or something. And so he's saying, he's saying, imagine a kingdom and there are these six painters and they each are specialists in certain things. You know, one paints these gorgeous hands, you know, and that's what he does. And somebody else, they really can capture your face, you know, and, and they each have this specialization. And so to them, a sovereign king hands a canvas. Right? So this, the king of the land makes a big, huge canvas, right? And he orders them, you know, and he says, um, all of you paint my portrait. Upon hearing this, they begin to collaborate on painting the portrait. Right, so he's making, he's telling a story, which actually comes from a sutra. Right, so, so there's this powerful king, and the king says, you know, I want my official portrait. I guess even in, in, with even a presidential portraits, right? So, if it, but a king does, you know, the king demands it. It's a serious command, right? Um, so the six painters begin working on the painting, right, on this portrait of the king. It says, then one of the engaged painters leaves for another place. By departing and leaving their part of the portrait incomplete, the portrait in its entirety could not be actualized. Uh, right, so this is the story, right? So these six, the, the king commands the six artists to collaborate and produce this beautiful portrait. They start painting and then one of them skips town, right, and goes to another kingdom. And of course, the other five, won't be able to create a beautiful portrait of the monarch because they don't know how to do, you know, so for example, if the person who does the face, right, they'll have this beautiful sort of hands and beautiful legs and a beautiful torso and, you know, and an outline there, you know, or something and a uh, king won't be pleased, right? And the portrait won't be, uh, well, as it says, it cannot be actualized, then. it can't be completed. It says, this is the way the example is applied. The individual parts of the portrait are expressions of generosity, discipline, patience, and so on. Emptiness, which is endowed with all aspects, is expressed by the complete portrait of the king. Right. So what's he saying here? He's saying, what's Maitreya saying, right? According to Sutra, he's saying, um, we all have Buddha nature, right? Um, and at the same time, if you want to produce this final state of utter purity, right, this final state of the Dharmakaya, you have to practice all six perfections, right? Uh, you have to practice patience and, you know, generosity, ethics, uh, joyful effort, right? Uh, meditative concentration and wisdom. And, you, and, uh, and if you leave one out, you won't achieve that final state, right? Um, and so he's saying, uh, because wisdom, exalted wisdom, and liberation are individual. Oh, actually, that gets jumping to another topic. So uh, he, he gets down to, oh, the individual parts of the of the expression of the portrait are expressions of generosity, dissipation, and so on. Emptiness, which is endowed with all aspects, right? So that's Buddhahood, right? 
is expressed by the complete portrait, right? So once you have all six artists collaborating well, you get the portrait. The metaphor here is once you have all six, or, uh, pra the practice of all six perfections completed, then you have Buddhahood. Um, I want to pause there and reflect on that point for a few minutes, because Gelsom Jay does in his commentary. So Gelsom Jay says a number of things um, there, but one thing, one point he's making is uh, Gelsom Jay kind of goes on a bit, I mean, explains a bit about this metaphor or this uh, story of the king, right, and the, and the painters, the artists. At one point, he's, he, sa he says, um, he's saying, you know, on the one hand, we all have Buddha nature, right? And, it, and then he says a few things. He says, that doesn't mean that you'll become an actual resultant Buddha unless you do all the practices required to do that. Because Buddhahood itself is a dependent arising. Everything is dependent arising, right? Uh, you know, everything, you know, nothing exists independently. So one point is <clears throat> even the resultant state of a Buddha requires all the causes and conditions for that state to arise. Those causes and conditions are the perfections that a Bodhisattva practices. <clears throat> That's one point. Another point that Gyalsa J <clears throat> says is that, um, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking. Sometimes there are certain Buddhist scriptures or texts that will say you're already a Buddha. <clears throat> and um, and Gyalsa J numerous times says that's um, not literally true. That's maybe an encouraging. I mean, he doesn't say it this way. I'm adding this right part. It might be encouraging. I've, I've actually, I've shared this before. <clears throat> I have some friends who, from when they're feeling hopeless, that really helps them. You know, like, they feel, I'm already a Buddha. So, okay, I, don't, I won't give up hope. So that's good. You know, that's a good thing. But it's not literally true. <laughs> and Gautam J clarifies that. Um, and then both Lama Tsongkhapa in some of his teachings and Gyalsa J go into more detail. Because, um, and this is where I'm going to do, I'm gonna, again, I said today, I'm going to do a little philosophical. Um, there is There are some Buddhist sort of philosophers, I guess, in Tibet, who assert, who have asserted this idea that you're, you really are already a Buddha. And Lama Tsongkhapa and his teachings um, is quite direct in disagreeing with them and saying that is a wrong understanding of this text of the uh, particularly of the Maitreya texts but also of, of the Buddhist teachings in general and Gyaltsev J follows Lama Tsongkhapa uh, in that um, presentation so I'll read a quote from Gyaltsev J where he says he says someone uh, by the way Lama Tsongkhapa and Gyaltsev J are funny this way they, they'll often do if you be both of them if you read their texts they don't want to they're, they're like they don't want to say if they're going to agree with someone they'll say so and so said this and i really respect that if they're going to disagree with someone they often just say someone <laughs> uh because they don't want to sort of put the person down and oftentimes actually if you read uh, jeffrey hopkins makes this point in his uh, translations of, of lama sokapa's teachings actually where he says he says actually that um sometimes the same person like when lama sokapa agrees with a person like i'm going to mention uh, one of the philosophers is dol popa uh, is a Tibetan philosopher from a little bit, but who's uh, lived about a hundred years, I think, before Tsongkhapa was born, or maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, <laughs> Jeffrey Hopkins makes the point: there are times where Tsongkhapa likes something that Dolpopa wrote about a certain tantra, and he says he, he'll sort of say the the great Dolpopa, or the you know sort of. But then when he said when he's going to disagree with the philosophical view of Dolpopa, he'll say somebody said, uh, <laughs> you know, because he he doesn't want to insult you know somebody who he respects actually, but. But he's going to disagree with their philosophical position, and Gyalsa J does the same thing. Um, actually, I'll just say something funny for me. You know, often lens Lama Tsongkhapa is depicted with Gyalsa J and Kedrub J. I, I've noticed this sometimes. I've read some of the teachings of Kedrub J. I think he's he's a little less gentle in that way. Like Gyalsa J is will disagree strongly with somebody, but won't say who they are. Kedrub J is a little more uh, yeah. direct and fierce. Or something. He's kind of a fierce. You, I thought oh, I wouldn't have wanted a, a debate with Kedrub J if it were up to me, but. Uh, but anyway, so Gyalsam J says someone. So I was just, I was explaining why he says someone. That's why I think he's being 
polite. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, someone under the guise of expounding the Buddha's teachings uh, ex uh, extensively propounded a non-Buddhist's presentation of the self. They claim that the short, middle, and extensive Prajnaparamita, or Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, teach merely the self-emptiness of the conventional and not the final ultimate truth that is taught in the last turning of the wheel. Someone who makes such statements lack the fortune of really even reading the commentary. Uh, so he's quite nice about it, I think. Uh, but but he's saying they don't understand what they're talking about. Um, and, uh, and then later, uh, in addressing this particular passage about the painters, Jal Tzu Jay goes further. That's earlier in the text. Later in this section about the painters, Gyal Tzu Jay makes the point that all six perfections are required to produce the state of Buddhahood. Then he says, um, meditative equipoise upon suchness or emptiness, right? Adorned with every aspect of method, such as the perfection of giving and so on, right? And he describes all six perfections. And he says, uh, the stages along the path completed in dependence upon conventional truth and ultimate truth are required to finally produce a perfect Buddha, right? So he's saying you have to practice not just wisdom, but also the method aspects of the past, which are the other five perfections, generosity and so on. Those are methods, right? Uh, it's not just wisdom. And then he says, the assertion that emptiness endowed with every supreme aspect, right? So that's uh, Tathagata state, right? The Buddhahood, right? So emptiness endowed with every supreme aspect is a reference to the Buddha, Buddha's Buddhahood. So he says, the assertion that that is the ultimate truth adorned with all excellent qualities, such as the 10 powers, has existed in the continuum of sentient beings since beginningless time, right? So saying that the actual state of Buddha has existed in the continuum of all sentient beings since beginningless time is an assertion no different from Samkhya outsiders. Those are not, uh, Hindu philosophers who assert uh, theism, right? So he's saying that's a theistic view. And he says, because this school also asserts uh, that's such a school, such a theistic school also asserts, they both, right? A Buddhist who would assert that is the same as a theistic uh, philosopher because they're asserting a universal source as a permanent but functional phenomena, uh, which exists as the ultimate reality uh, at the essence of all things uh, with forms and sounds and so on coming from that source. So what he's saying, what's he saying there? And this is, uh, I actually, I probably do various translations because I was reading them last night, because this point about, he says, such a philosopher, right, that asserts, he's making numerous points here. One is, he's, but it's simply, he's saying, if you assert that that you're, that the actual state of a Buddha already exists within all beings, right, which, by the way, he's, he's referring, in both of those two quotes, he's referring back to that former philosopher, Dolpopa, who asserted that. And there are various people since him who have asserted that. And Lama Tsongkhapa and Gyal Tsumjai strongly disagree with that stance. They've written both wrote a lot uh, disagreeing with it, Tsongkhapa in particular. And there are many reasons why <laughs> that Tsongkhapa gives as to why he disagrees with that. But here, uh, Gyal Tsumjai is making one or two of those points. And he says, uh, one point is he, he's saying, that's not, he's saying, uh, and Lama Tsongkhapa, I'll explain in a minute, the, Lama Tsongkhapa says more about this than Gyal Tsumjai does. And Gyal Tsumjai, by the way, says, this has been written about more elsewhere. You can look if you agree. Um, one point he's making is that's not a Buddhist view. The view that there's some kind of primordial Buddha at the essence of all beings, no Buddha. And, and Lama Tsongkhapa explains further about that. He says, one point is he says, well, Majamaka says, you're asserting this is supposed to be Mahayana, right? A philosophical position. He says, but the two schools, the two big schools of Mahayana that then have sub-schools are the Majamaka and the mind only. And then Sokapa goes through an extensive explanation of how Majamaka doesn't assert that, and Nagarjuna very clearly doesn't assert that. And then also Asanga and Vasubandhu don't assert that. They're the main philosophers of the mind only. So one point Lama Sokapa makes is he says, well, if that's not a view of the mind only school and it's not a view of the Majamakas, then it's not a Mahayana position that you can take. It's something made up. That's one point Lama Tsongkhapa makes. Another point Lama Tsongkhapa makes, which Gyal Tsub Jay is directly referencing here, is he says, you're asserting a permanent but functional phenomenon. 
And what does that mean, right? What that means is this, is uh, according to the Buddhist philosophy, right, functional phenomena are impermanent, right? They're produced by causes and conditions. Anything that's produced by causes and conditions changes instant by instant. So it's not unchanging, permanent in the sense of unchanging, right? And um, if you assert that the final ultimate truth is something that's functional in that sense, that produces, you know, that produces, that's a cause that produces effects, you can't say it's unchanging then because it's interdependent. And that which is interdependent isn't permanent. It's changing. And... Um, and uh, Jeffrey Hopkins goes into a lot of detail about this in his uh, treatment of it, because he says, he actually looks back to the teachings of Dolpopa, and he says, well, actually, Dolpopa doesn't explicitly say I'm asserting a permanent but functional thing. But Dolpopa says the ultimate final truth, he does say it's um, permanent. And then he says things like it has color. And it, you know, because he says it has the five Buddha, the five bodies of a Buddha, the five, uh, sorry, the five, the five uh, lineages, you know, of tantra. That are one is white, one is red, one is yellow, one is, and so Jeffrey Hopkins says, you know, so Kappa is taking the implication of that. He's saying once you say something has color, it has to be, you know, it has to be interdependent with an eye consciousness. Um, how is that permanent? It's producing an effect on an eye consciousness, so it's not. Permanent, then. It's a functioning thing. So a functioning thing has to have causes and conditions. But you're saying it was primordially unchanging. That's not a tenable position. Another point that Gyatsubje is saying that Tsongkhapa makes here is, well, if you're saying also that something can be permanent and existed primordially, but also be producing effects in the world, that's not, first of all, it's illogical, as I just said. And secondly, that's a theistic position, actually. That's the view, that's what there is, people say that's what, you know, uh, these Samkhya outsider, outsider means non-Buddhist, uh, Samkhyas are a certain school of Hindu thought. And uh, and he's saying that's the same thing they say, that there's some being outside of, that's permanent, that's outside of causality, but somehow produces effects and produce the world. You know, the prime mover on move kind of idea that in Western philosophy, right? Somehow that something can be, um, can be permanent, can be there from the beginning, can be unchanging yet produce effects, right? That's not, but and Buddhism says that's not possible. That's philosophically and logically an untenable position. And it's saying once you assert a primordial Buddha in all beings that's producing, that's the final ultimate, um, you essentially stop being Buddhist and you become a theist, you become a theist who's now asserting a kind of Buddha as Brahma, or something, Buddha as. Yahweh or Buddha as what well, you know, even that uh, it's course they, they would use for Hindu beings, but same idea, you know. Uh, it's a, it, there is some kind of that. Um, anyway, you get the point. So that's another objection that Gyaltsu raised. Buddha and Zeus. Yeah, but as Zeus, and the same idea doesn't work. <clears throat> um, I want to make a few more points here because th th that's what Gyaltsu said. Now I'm going to elaborate a little further philosophically. Um, because, and I'll just say it because Gautam Jay brought it up. So this is getting at, you know, this view of Dolpopa, which in um, which in Tibetan history became known as the, um, it became, uh, uh, um, that view became known as Shen Tong view, which in Tibetan. And Shen means other, and Tong is empty. Right, so they say it's a view of, so it's called the view of other emptiness. Whereas, um, Tsongkhapa's view, most uh, Tsongkhapa's position is that all Buddhist views are what they what in this debate came to be called uh, rung tong. Rung means self, and tong is empty. So if you debate the two, then sometimes you'll see books that say other emptiness and self emptiness. <clears throat> it's just two translations of it's just translations into English of uh, rung tong and shen tong of these two Tibetan terms, um, and. Uh, You'll come across that. I mean, originally that Dolpopa was a was was a was a tradition in Tibet called the Jornangpa, which still exists. And then, um, in later times, some uh, some writers, uh, the some Jornangpa writers, and then later some uh, 
I'm aware of some writers in the Enigma tradition, maybe some Kagyu, I'm not sure. I think some Kagyu, a lot of writers, so certain as individual philosophers have taken this position. Um, and uh, so Kappa himself wrote a lot, uh, saying he thought it was an incorrect position, as I just mentioned. Galtzim Jane Kidder did, and then later Galipo philosophers and others too. Uh, I mean, so Kappa didn't start that stance against, I uh, disagree with that. Um, his teacher, actually, Randawa, was a Sakya scholar who wrote uh, disagreeing with that view. So Kappa elaborated further on Randawa's position, and then that became part of the Galipo tradition. Um, and uh, maybe I'll share a few more brief points about this because I, I, I think this is where I'll cover it. Uh, it's mentioned a few times in Gelsum J's text, so I just thought I'll sort of say a little more about it. Um, so uh, one point is that this this uh, other emptiness position, I'll quote Bob Thurman first. Uh, uh, he says um, about other emptiness, he says, it takes the, that other emptiness position takes the view that absolute reality is absolutely established. <laughs> Um, and that therefore emptiness is a concrete emptiness that is the absolute devoid of the relative, right? And Jeffrey Hopkins sort of says other points that are similar, but, right, so he's saying there's this kind of, and uh, one another point that Tsongkhapa makes many times is if you look at the Prajnaparamita Sutras, they repeatedly say emptiness is empty. Um, and this school doesn't agree with that. So they say the Prajnaparamita sutras are wrong on that point, you know, that they don't, or that they're not definitive. That, uh, and, um, and then Thurman goes on to say, Dolpopa says emptiness is the true nature of reality, that Dolpopa's position is that emptiness is the true nature of reality and it is radically other, it is a radically other reality, other than the world of illusion. Um, it itself is not empty, but is absolutely established. And it is not self-empty. So that's it. So there are a number of points here. One is, right, Tsongkhapa and, according to him, Nagarjuna and Asanga and so on, say all phenomena are empty of an intrinsically existent self, including emptiness itself. People are, the mind is, and emptiness is. Dolpopa says, no, emptiness is... And, and part of what Thurman's getting at, I won't read the exact quote, but he's saying, actually, I'll read this one in like Thurman's language. He says, other emptiness is an alternate reality, an absolute other. Um, and he's saying, and what is, and so the Pope's position is there's this, there's this ultimate nature that's separate and apart, right? Um, from reality. It's the opposite. I mean, actually, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the his view is the opposite of the Heart Sutra, right? The Heart Sutra says form is empty. Emptiness is form. Right, uh, that there's a harmony of conventional and ultimate truth. Dolpopa's position is that the ultimate, as Thurman said, is is radically other, right? And that what and then in his view, what's it empty of? What it says, other emptiness. It's empty of all conventional phenomena. And so Kappa says, wait a second, that's denigrating conventional phenomena. Whereas conventional conventional phenomena is the basis of compassion. Right, uh, conventional phenomena like suffering beings are conventional phenomena, right? And so, if if you're saying, well, in the ultimate, those don't really exist at all, then where then that undermines, uh, and Thurman makes that point, that undermines the basis of compassion, actually. So that's so so Kappa, for that reason, also doesn't like that position, um, and uh, I don't know how deep to go into these other points. Um, Another point some Kappa makes is, you know, the if you look psychologically and practically at the basis for your mental afflictions, it's the grasping at a self of person. It's for, for, for the, the, the primary one is grasping at your own self of persons, right? Um, and uh, well, I can't remember if it's Gelsub J or. Somebody else, but one of them uses, I think it's Gyalsabjay, but it might be some Kappa, I can't remember which, uses a metaphor. He says, you know, there's a traditional metaphor in Buddhism that's often used, where it says if, you're, if it's dusk and you're outside and you see a snake, I mean, you see, I'm sorry, you see something you think is a snake and you get scared. And then it turns out it's a rope that was somebody left on the ground, but because it's dusk and you weren't looking closely, you thought it was a snake. Um, 
that's often used as a metaphor for emptiness. You know, you, you, we become frightened by something that's not there from the side of the object. And uh, so the metaphor, the, 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 uh, I forget which political philosopher, but maybe some help, I think, uh, uses that metaphor. And he says, he says, to become free from the fear, you have to investigate that phenomena and discover it's not a, um, a snake, that it's just a rope, right? Uh, and then he says, how will it help you, basically, if you say, um, well, there's somewhere else, there's an ultimate that's free of snakes. Like, well, I'm here. And this is my, you know, like, in other words, I need to investigate my own experience. Not, and there, there is, and um, yeah, and not that, um, that it's not really, a, and, and another point he's making, what he's actually getting at, though, is this, is the foundation for our mental afflictions is the way we grasp at things on the conventional level. That, there is that, that we mistake what actually exists and we grasp at something that doesn't exist right there. Um, and if you sort of reify an ultimate, which is what Sankapa is asserting Dol Popa is doing, you actually leave that grasping at phenomena unharmed. You, know, you sort of say, oh, it doesn't exist. I'm going to escape to this other place. But you actually haven't undermined that perception. You sort of maybe, um, Sankapa doesn't say this, but you've kind of spaced out into a different, you know, sort of constructed idea, but you haven't actually undermined that grasping. So when you, you're going to come back to interacting, you're still going to be grasping at a self of persons and a self of objects, and you're still going to give rise to mental affliction. So you won't undermine the actual root of the mental affliction. So it's not an effective method also. And so Kappa, I, I, the way I take, when I read him on this point, that seems like a core point because his motivation for writing is compassion. And he's saying, you know, if somebody takes that wrong position and practices based on it, they actually won't become free. They won't achieve the result and stay. So that's not okay. So I need to sort of explain that point. So he goes into great detail. Um, the parts, uh, there are other things that I'm not sure, but I, I, I mean, I'm not sure how deep to go into this, but I'll just make one more point. He also gets into um, He gets into, uh, so Kaba addresses this a lot in his text on, called uh, The Essence of Eloquence, which is a teaching in which he addresses the um, definitive and interpretable teachings of the Buddha. He says, what teachings of the Buddha are definitive and what ones are philosophical points that are that need require, require further interpretation? And um, in that text, he addresses that in general, very exhaustively, and then he also um, particularly brings up these positions and refutes them says those are not this those aren't even interpretable meanings those are incorrect meanings he sort of addresses that and um and he says also they misunderstood certain points about they actually i think actually what the pope was doing at least my understanding of it is that he was actually trying to create a synthesis synthesis of the mind only position and the majamaka position and sort of create a sense of synthesis of those two and tantra all into one sort of stance and uh, in the essence of eloquence, Sonkapa essentially says, in his says in Dopopa's attempt to do that, he misunderstood first of all the position of the mind only school as a majamaka school, and also they weren't meant to be in a synthesis. They're two different positions uh, that are both valid practice, valid ways to practice Buddhism, but they're different and they have their own meanings, uh, and. I'll say one last thing, which may be a little too philosophical. I don't know, too too much into going into the weeds for this purpose, but I'll just say it because maybe somebody's interested. Um, another point Sonkaba makes is he says, you know, in the Majamaka school, right, it's clear that we're refuting true existence of phenomena, or in, in you know, in the Prasangika, intrinsic existence, right, or inherent existence. And um that's what's taught in the Prajna Paramita Sutras. And he makes the point, you know, nobody can think of that as an other emptiness because you're refuting the, the self of phenomena, right? And the self of persons. And then he says, he makes the point that uh, Dolpopa kind of used some points from the um, Chita Mantra, the mind only school, uh, to sort of create his philosophical position. And, uh, and he says, they also are not, that the mind only school also is not saying things are that there's an ultimate truth that's 
un ultimately established that, uh, and that it's empty of all conventional phenomena. Their position about emptiness, which actually I taught the class on um, tenets on for the center, their position is that, uh, so Kappa explains it, is that things are, that, that uh, you know, one point he makes is that external phenomena are empty of uh, existing separate apart from the mind, right? That they don't exist independent of the mind. Another point is that they're they're also empty of existing uh, from their own side as the referent for our terms and language about them. But that doesn't mean they're empty of existing at all. Uh, and that asserting they're empty of existing at all in the ultimate sense is a kind of nihilistic position. Uh, so that's another reason why Tsongkhapa disagrees with Bill Popa's stance. He says it's reifying the ultimate and sort of making it it's asserting that the ultimate truth exists in some kind of, that it's not empty, that emptiness isn't empty, which is a reification, and it's not valid because it's exaggerating that it exists in a kind of more concrete way than it does. And it's also denigrating conventional reality, and as if it doesn't have any uh, conventional existence, which is not, which undermines uh, conventional reality is not true. Uh, things do exist conventionally. And so he says so it's also guilty of a kind of both of the two faults, in a way, of over reifying and also nihilistic kind of stance. Um, so anyway, there are other points that Kappa makes, and um, that will. Yeah. Is that related to the the discussion oftentimes of the relationship between emptiness and dependent arising? That it, I, I've always kind of struggled with that, trying to understand the differences and the complementarity. But is that? Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. So I don't know if people could hear that. He was saying, "Is that getting at the uh, this issue of uh, the harmony of dependent arising and emptiness?" And uh, yes, yeah, and that's you know, uh, it's a great that's a great focus for Tsongkhapa in his uh, writings, and part of that is um, actually this. I'll just I'll say it just briefly. Like, there's a story actually that um, you know, when Tsongkhapa was trying to understand the nature of the ultimate. Of ultimate truth, he often had, you know, there was came a point in his meditative practice where he could have these dialogues with Manjushri, right? And um, and he was considered an emanation of Manjushri. But anyway, um, it's said that one of the things Manjushri said to him is, emphasize the validity of the conventional. Don't leave out the conventional. Don't de-emphasize the conventional. It's kind of that that was part of Tsongkhapa's mission in a way. The world, or from Manjushri, was to. Uh, explicate how you know uh, dependent arising and emptiness have the same meaning and that emptiness is not something apart from uh that's it's not a separate entity from the conventional right there is the form the you know that's why it says right uh, form is empty and emptiness is form that's why it's on copy and you know actually it said it come from the right in the um in his three principal aspects of the path I'll quote it perfectly. He says, oh, three principles. There we go. Three principles actually the path. He says, um, If appearance of dependent relation, which is unbetrayed, right? So the interdependence, right? Or dependent arising. So if the appearance of dependent relation, which is unbetraying, is accepted separately from emptiness, as long as they are seen as separate, one has still not realized the Buddha's intent, right? Which is getting exactly your point. And so Tsongkhapa is really emphasizing that point that if you see dependent arising, and emptiness as two separate things, you haven't yet understood what the Buddha was saying. Um, and of course, this position would be seeing them as quite separate. Uh, as utter, uh, this position would be seeing them as utterly separate or as essentially separate. So again, you can see why Tsongkhapa would disagree with this position. And, and his assertion is that, right? And it says, when if these, two, if these two realizations are happening simultaneously without alternation, and for merely seeing dependent relation as completely unbetraying, the definite ascertainment comes that completely destroys all way the way uh, all objects are apprehended as truly existent, 
at that time, the analysis of the ultimate view is complete. Right? So the, there is a, the harmony, as you were getting at, the harmony of dependent rising and emptiness is the intent of the Buddha. Um, and anything that takes us further from that is taking us further from liberation and further from enlightenment. So Sankapa, for Sankapa, this is not a, this isn't, I mean, this isn't in the, this isn't a merely sort of intellectual question. This is a, you know, how do you say that? I can even say a soteriological question. This is a, a question of, uh, you know, it's an ethical question. It's a question of compassion and it's a, que and it's a question of the goal that you're aiming towards spiritually. So it's, you know, it's a practical question in that sense. Yeah. yeah. And other comments or questions? Yeah. So with earlier what you were mentioning about the archive and the Fred Yakubuda paths and the sort of the resting battle. So is that does that serve, I guess, to sort of include like the Theravada teachings into the whole thing? Because I know they don't read you know, all over the same scripture. So is that basically to say that they're not incorrect or it's not heresy or anything like that it's just like and so is that kind of what that serves the, the point of that yeah so it's a song i mean that quick where sangha is saying it's like a resting place at you know, one point is i mean those scriptures are accepted by all i mean the, so there is the uh, sutras the, the sutras that are accepted by the Theravada tradition are accepted by the maya uh, there's nobody uh, there I, I, yeah the mahayana accepts those as valid teachings of the buddha and what a sangha yeah is saying is that that uh though is that um and at one point is those we often say those are practices in common that bodhisattvas are expected to practice those teachings also actually so bodhisattvas are actually expected to practice not just do they accept that those are valid teachings but they're sort of things bodhisattvas are supposed to practice so they can help others who want to achieve those goals you know even if the bodhisattva doesn't want to achieve that goal for themselves they're supposed to know those paths in order to help those who want to practice the, that that right? and also some of the threat like ethics are common to all and so on so there are many points there but um But yeah, but what a sangha is, what he says, is like a, a resting place in the forest. He's saying that the goal of that is, is sort of is um, exactly what you said. It's sort of so it's included in this overall kind of picture of how beings progress to Buddhahood, uh, but that it's not a final end. That's all. Yeah. And then John has his hand up. Which I guess, yeah. um, now John's ready to say. <laughs> it, maybe it applies to this point. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I if, if everybody has the uh, root text, this is on page 25, and it's uh, verse 1.156. You mean of a, of a, I'm sorry, the root text of... Um... Yeah, I, I can just read it too. It's it's four lines, but okay, good. I think this, it, this really, I've come back to this particular verse again and again, and uh, the discussion last week, I think, really related to it as well as what we've been talking about today, but... It states that uh, the basic element is empty of adventitious defilements, which are separable in character. It is not empty of the unsurpassable qualities, which are of inseparable character. So I think, you know, when I first read this, you know, it, I could see how this really lends itself into the uh, other emptiness position as well as maybe the mind-only position. And uh, so I was really puzzled by that, you know, given our earlier discussion in, in past weeks and months, as well as um, calling this a, a Prasangika teaching. Uh, so it just, uh, you know, I just looked at this and looked at this. I think that uh, for one thing, it brought up the, uh, the concept of the two truths, as well as... Um, you know, what we were discussing last week, which was uh, the meaning of intrinsic or the meaning of inherent. And, um, you know, I think that I'm thinking it's just a matter of the way our minds work because we think of things conceptually that we fall into that trap of wanting to think that something has a permanent um, independent existence. And, you um, so one thing I was thinking about last week was that, um, you know, and again, your discussion about Buddha nature not being dependent on causes and conditions, not being dependent on parts, but being dependent upon labeling. 
about the way the mind projects, you know, the superimposition of understanding that it actually is not present in the suchness uh, of the object. And um, I think that that's the way to understand this, this whole thing is that um, when we say that Buddha nature is not empty of these insurpassable, un insurpassable qualities, you know, like the way we are defining purity and permanence and so on, that it's inseparable from, the, from that, um, is that to the mind that has cultivated the six perfections, you know, the collections of uh, merit and wisdom that independence upon that kind of mind that Buddha nature is perceptible. Absent the collections of that, that merit and wisdom or the six perfections, it's not going to be apparent. It's not going to appear. So that that's the dependence that I think that comes in. So anyway, that's the way I, I can reconcile this verse with, uh, with the Prasangika understanding, you know, and that maybe um, contradicts that, you know, what you were explaining is explaining is the other emptiness position. One further point, too, that I had was just that um, in as much as I've looked at other emptiness, which, it, which is not in a great deal of detail, but one definition I saw was that um, other emptiness means that um, that things are actually empty of the defilements, but they're not empty of the qualities that we've been defining, you know, from the Prasangika perspective as permanence, purity, and so on. So one thing I wonder is that uh, if it's appropriate really to make a blanket statement <laughs> about other emptiness, because, you know, they're coming from that perspective of Gelsum J. Because the Nyingma teachings that I've heard don't really go as far as Gelsop J, J does in saying that um, that it's an incorrect reifying of Buddha nature that way. So, so anyway, I hope that made a little bit of sense to, to others, but uh, it, it's, it's something that I'm still working with and trying to understand more clearly. Um, one other quick question, uh, Lauren, is that notion of John Chu, is that synonymous with Sangye? Yep, yeah. Yeah, they're oh. said to be they have the same meaning. Yep. Okay. And then and Sangye, the two syllables have also the same idea. Yeah, that um Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah the two syllables have the same two implications. Yeah. And then Rob has the hand up, yeah. I really appreciate that you took time to really um, pinpoint this, these verses and bring up this idea of Shantong and how to differentiate between that and um, mind only, as well as maybe the other Madhyamaka school, you know, either Yogacara or, and how this differentiates. And I really appreciate that, you know, John was bringing up this idea of how to get a handle on this this incredibly subtle aspect of Buddha nature. You know, when you're thinking about Buddha nature as being um, beginningless and endless, we tend to want to put a sign at permanence. And um, how to hold that? And I think that that is the brilliance or the amazingness of dependence origination and why it was such a big aha for Tsongkhapa. And if we keep that on our screen and are in our mind in terms of how to see this, this nature, you know, it, it's really obvious. I mean, it's, it's clear that people would want to try and say that it's already there and it just needs the obscurations to be un unveiled or something like that. But it's, it isn't there because it hasn't 
you, you, you don't haven't created the cost for it yet. Yeah. Right? Is that That's sort right. of yeah. you know, and of course we'd love for you to tell us exactly how <laughs> our they'll have some confidence tell us exactly, but it's a an experiential thing, I think. Yeah. Anyway, that's my observation. Looks thank you so much for really tweezing this out <laughs> from these. Thank places. you both. I'm for, thank you, Robin, and also John both for really interesting comments. I think that bring the discussion further. Yeah. And then somebody else. Oh, yeah. Lynn has their hand up. Lynn. <laughs> Lynn. Yeah, I think I agree with Robin. It's almost like in this instruction not to abandon the conventional um, suffering. It's it's the way through to transcending that is through the suffering itself. So the, the idea you don't abandon the the conventional view of suffering, but you work through it to get someplace else it's not over there it's through it and it reminded me of um, this music i heard last night it was a it was an opera by the african-american jazz artist but it was about his i think it was his i don't know but this terrible childhood trauma he suffered and the music transcended that in an amazing way from that suffering but like music does, <laughs> but it's almost the same thing you're saying. You don't, it's not there's an over there and, and here, it's joint together. And the way to get to enlightenment or something approaching that is through the suffering, not disregarding, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's sort of like not, not saying I'm going to reject conventional views of things or what's going on, but it's actually a way through it. Yeah. I'll make a quick comment too, just um, in reference to that one verse that, that you quoted, John, um, yeah. if you look in Gyaltsevje's commentary to that verse, he um, he addresses that again with a reference. He, he again brings it up, I remember that, uh, and brings up the view of Dopopa in his explaining that verse. And, and it, he makes a number of points, which are, one is, um, you know that the uh he, th he makes a few points one is that you know the important point a few more important points he makes the basic element is empty of adventitious defilements that's really essential to understanding buddha nature isn't it there is that the the defilements aren't in the nature of mind right that's really essential that they're not there is that they like and he uses the metaphor of clouds passing through the sky. You know that that uh, clouds can pass through the sky, but they're not sky, right? They're clouds. Um, so the the defilements can be separated from mind. And um, he makes another point, though. Uh, well, he said he said that you know if you he he brings up the. Uh, Dobopa's view and, and sort of says, if you understand this, if you understand this verse in that way, you've misunderstood this verse. He makes that point. Um, oh yeah, and here he says, so he says, and if you understand that the defilements are adventitious, then you can understand that karma is advent. You know that the the suffering that comes from the mental afflictions and karma are also adventitious, which of course is the point. Um, and I guess. One other point, I don't think he says this clearly. I don't. I can't find where he says it. But I, my, I'll say just one point about this verse. Um, the, I mean, it's how I at least hear His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he talks about this topic, he makes a point that if if you understand the basic element, right? If you understand that there is the nature of mind, then that undermines. It's actually the antidote to right. So it undermines the mental afflictions. It undermines uh, it undermines the process of karma and undermines suffering. But if you understand the basic element, that doesn't undermine positive qualities. So that doesn't undermine love. That doesn't undermine compassion. That doesn't undermine skillful means, um, and so on, because you understand the harmony of dependent arising and emptiness. So that 
enhances your ability actually to practice the six perfections. And um, and so in that sense also, um, you know, one way of saying it is that, I mean, on the one hand, the emptiness of mind allows for both mental afflictions and virtuous qualities to arise. But understanding the basic element undermines the mental afflictions, but allows us to actually increase, it helps us to increase our positive qualities. Um, and the final fruition of understanding the basic element actually is inseparable from the qualities, all the qualities of a Buddha. Um, so I think that's a more useful way to view that verse. I mean, we'll get into it more when we get to that verse, but I just think that's a more useful way to view that verse than the way um, it sometimes is interpreted. But I also want to say what, and one last comment, and then I want to make sure to just finish this section. Um, you're right. Also, somebody, I can't remember if it was uh, John or Robin or both, but uh, somebody made the comment, you know, it's true, actually, there, you know, um, actually, I'll just say, I won't say, but I, I remember, um, I guess I'll say this right away. You know, there are teachers now who, who you hear, and you can hear them teach, and they'll express a view that's kind of similar to Dolpopa's um, view, Tibetan teachers and Western teachers, you know, and, and um, one point I'll make is Tsongkhapa would not agree with them, and uh, neither would Gelsum Jay, and neither would, you know, um, and I once heard the Dalai Lama address that he was teaching the essence of eloquence actually in, in New York. And he, and he said, he said, um, he brought that up and he, he said, uh, you know, he basically, you know, he was teaching some kappa. So he, he basically, you know, and he, but he acknowledged that there were teachers who would sort of present a different view. And then, and then he made an interesting presentation. Actually, I don't, I don't know, it's probably not useful to go into huge detail, but he kind of, he, he made the point that, um, he, he stands with the view that of Nagarjuna that dependent rising is the meaning of emptiness and emptiness is the meaning of dependent rising. Um, and then, so he said, so, you know, viewing other emptiness as sort of in the way that it's characterized would not be ultimately correct, would be in a sort of, uh, and then he said, he made the point though that uh, So it's right way. Well, he made he made this point basically that uh, in terms of the ultimate truth of emptiness, uh, it's a self emptiness. But then he made a point of from the con, from a conventional perspective, there comes a point. He made a point of pra when practicing highest yoga tantra, there's a part there's a part of the practice where you're trying to manifest the most subtle mind of innate clear light, which manifests in time of death. And he says. Uh, so this part is not about ultimate truth. He's just saying there, there does come a point where you're you're actually having to manifest a level of mind that's so subtle that it doesn't perceive uh, any other phenomena because it is when you're, like for example, at the moment of actual death, right? You're in a state where you're not perceiving anything other than the most subtle mind. And he says, well, that mind is empty of other, not ultimately, it's not, it's not the ultimate truth, but it's empty of other appearances. He said that's a useful way of understanding other emptiness. Uh, that that's the mind of the mind at the moment of death, and the mind that you manifest. You can manifest that mind through yogic practice and highest yoga tantra completion stage practices. And he says, in that sense, you are manifesting a mind that's empty of all other appearances. It's not. You then have to use that mind to realize the ultimate nature of phenomena, which is emptiness. Still, uh, so he says that doesn't can't get around that fact. But there is, a, he says, you know, from a conventional perspective, that is a mind that's empty of other appearances. So that might be a useful way of understanding that, which I thought was an interesting position this one was the Lama took. I thought it was also trying to, I, I took it as also that he was sort of showing, oh, trying to be, I mean, holding his own philosophical position, which accorded with some kappas, while also being non-sectarian, and also sort of paying respect to some Nyingma scholars who he had studied with, I think, who well, the position like that and saying, well, this is a useful way to understand when they talk about that, that it's, they, they might mean from a practice perspective in terms of the conventional nature of mind, but not the ultimate nature. Um, anyway, we got pretty deep into some of these philosophical <laughs> things. But um, which is about that time, and I want to I make sure to do something before we stop today, which is, oh, okay, so we were on the 10th point, right, of these 10 points. And there's one last thing about it, and then we, because I wanted to, yeah. So it says, um, the next verse says, because wisdom, exalted wisdom and liberation are indivisible from luminosity, radiance, and purity, they resemble the indivisibility of light, rays, and the disk of the sun. Remember at the beginning, there was that metaphor of the sun and that said the sun is not separate from its rays. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, Maitreya comes back to that. And he, sa and he says, um, 
he says, here's the metaphor. The commentary explains that out. It says, basically, here's the metaphor, right? Um, well, you can talk about uh, the disk of the sun, right? When you look up in the sky, you can talk about the light of the sun illuminating the earth. And you can talk about the sun, like rays, right? You can see like, sometimes the rays coming through the cloud, uh, clouds. And you say, you can speak about those three things separately. So they're, they're conceptually, you can conceptualize them as separate, but they're not separate. They're all the sun, right? In other words, you can't say that somehow the light is separate from, the light of the sun is separate from the sun. Ultimately, it's a, they're the same phenomena, but you can talk about them as, they're con conceptually, you can differentiate them. And he says, it's, he said, and he, he says, what's, what my trade is doing here is a metaphor. He's using that as a metaphor. The light is the wisdom, realizing reality, the ultimate truth as it is. And why is light a symbol for that? Because it eliminates darkness, right? And that kind of seeing things as they are eliminates the darkness of ignorance. Uh, the rays symbolize the exalted wisdom, knowing all phenomena, knowing the multiplicity. So the omniscient mind of the Buddha that knows all conventional phenomena. Why are the rays a metaphor for that? You know, well, there you can see individual rays, you know, you can see the individual ray here and there. Sometimes the ray comes through, the, you know, you can see various rays even coming down. So that it's a symbol for the Buddha's knowing the multiplicity of conventional, uh, conventionally existent phenomena. And then the disk of the sun, because it's, you know, if you look up in the sky, it's like bright, you know, um, is a symbol for the purity. Uh, which is which is a symbol of purity, which is um, me, which is which is a reminder or a metaphor for a cessation, right? The cessation of all the mental afflictions and their subtle imprints. And so, what this is saying is those three qualities, right? The Buddha's ability to know ultimate reality as it is, the Buddha's ability to know um, all conventional phenomena as through an omniscience, and the uh, cessation of all taints and the emptiness uh, of that. So the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. You can speak of them as separate, but like the sun and his rays, they're all of one entity, right? They're they're conceptually differentiable, but they're of one entity, uh, is what that metaphor is getting at. It says, so hence, without attaining Buddhahood, there is no attainment of the non-abiding nirvana, just as the sun cannot be observed, set apart from its light and its rays. Uh, and then it says that the Tagata essence is set out by way of these 10 presentations. Um, so we got to the end of that section. Um, and I just thought that was good to do today because um, I'll just say very briefly, uh, you know, actually I, I will, uh, well, next weekend for those who are in this region, they're Ling Rinpoche is teaching. Uh, where Guru Samadhi Center is a co-sponsor of the event. It's in Fairfax and Ling Rinpoche will teach on Saturday and Sunday. Anyways, on the website and you can attend. Please, so, come. But yeah, come enjoy. It's worth it. Yes, exactly. It's at it's at, at a hotel in Fairfax. Um, Jan is the expert on that. Oh, oh. Did I say something wrong? Yeah. <laughs> but um. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm about to shut up. But, but um. Uh. Anyway, so so Ling Rimshi will be teaching next weekend. Um and. Uh, we're going to continue on with the, these teachings, but uh, the month of May, I won't I won't be able to teach because I'm going to be actually out of town a bunch of this month, studying with one of my lamas. Um, so I'm going to be <laughs> traveling and being with him to study and both in person and online. And so it's going to be a very busy month for that purpose. Uh, so I'll resume classes in June. I already posted June, two June and one July class. I shared it uh, Oh, Jody posted it actually. Uh, it's the website. I share it with Jody and Jody posted it. It's the website. So uh, we have classes scheduled already for June and into July, and we'll continue on. And I think, you know, uh, so, so, but we won't, uh, we won't have class in May just because I won't, I won't have a Saturday yeah, free. Uh, I'll be studying, which will be a topic. I didn't, so we can, uh, well, help me teach another topic in the future more fully. So more, more skillfully. So that's good. But, um, and then next section, though, I'll just say, mention it because it's quite fun, is actually in some ways a really important section, which is the nine similes for Buddha nature. Um, and this is in some ways, I remember once I requested this, uh, uh, her teachings on the Uttara Tantra various times, but once at the center, we requested it from um, Kishis, Lele Kishi Sulga. And he really only taught the nine similes. He came and taught, but he just taught these nine similes because he felt they were kind of the essence in some ways of uh, the Buddha nature section. Uh, so they're quite beautiful. 
um, beautiful metaphors. I think they're they're a thing that will stick in your mind, and you'll remember. You know, I think if you study the nine similes, they'll stay in your mind forever. Uh, they're quite remarkable uh, images for Buddha nature. Um, and uh, and Jen, I had said to you, I thought actually, I think I was wrong. I said oh, I'll probably take the rest of the year, but probably it'll take a few months. Uh, not the whole year, rest of the year, but a few months to teach. Then we that. can tap you for another. Thing. And then we can go on to a different piece of mm -hmm. course on the other. Yeah, but uh, but those will take a few months to cover because it gets it. There's a brief presentation, and then there are in-depth presentations where he, he goes into. There's these beautiful images of like a Buddha, inside a decaying lotus or honey in a mm -hmm. beehive or, uh, grain hidden within a husk or gold inside of, filth like gold that's buried under the, in a bunch of poop or something like that, uh, or a jewel treasure in the earth and so on. Um, a statue of the Buddha. Anyway, there are 12, there are nine of them. But um, he'll go through what they, he'll go through them as a metaphor for how Buddha nature is hidden within. But then each of those gets at a certain quality, the, the metaphor of like the Buddha and the uh, statue of the Buddha and, or the gold, they both get it. The, the gold symbolizes a certain quality of the resultant state or the, of Buddha nature. It's not just a general metaphor. And each of the, you know, the, the decaying husk or the rags or the, they symbolize certain things that stop us from uh, revealing our Buddha nature. So they're kind of, they're both a general point about, wow, your Buddha nature is hidden within you, but they're also getting it, they tease out, the, the similes tease out different aspects of what Buddha nature is, what the resultant state will be, and also what the obstacles are that obscure it for us. So it's quite a fun, I think it's a fun section. And uh, that's what we'll pick up in June when we come back. But um, we should do it dedication. Oh, was there something you wanted to say? Did I, forget? Did I not say? Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the supreme jewel bodhicitta, where it has not arisen, may it arise and grow. Where it has arisen, may it not decrease, but increase more and more. In the snowy mountain paradise, you, the source of good and happiness, all powerful Chinrezik Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. Uh, I dedicate all these merits, which are merely labeled totally empty from their own side, so that the eye, who is merely labeled totally empty from its own side, may achieve Buddha's enlightenment, which is merely labeled totally empty from its own side, in order to lead all sentient beings, who are merely labeled totally empty from their own side, to the state of Buddha's enlightenment as quickly as possible. And um, also, you know, may through this study and practice and effort, may all of us be able to. Uh, realize, let's say we were studying the resultant state of the Dharmakaya, right? So Maitreya at the beginning of the text said, by studying this, these Vajra topics, you know, they're not easy, but then um, by studying them, we create the cause, right, to eventually actualize those resultant states. So may it be like that, you know, through our efforts today and studying, contemplating, discussing these topics, may we be able to, may they serve as causes for us to be able to actualize the Dharmakaya of the Buddha in order to be a benefit to all mothers and children. And thanks very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks. Hope that wasn't too deep a dive into those, some of those strange philosophical topics. But anyway, now we'll get into similes and it'll be a, lot, a little bit lighter. So yeah. it's okay. Have a great May. Right. Uh, thanks. Wonderful. Yeah. Great class. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. See you in June. <laughs> June. Yeah. 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 Yeah.